Right, all right. Welcome back to the show. The show that's cool and fly to A1 Forever Sports. I am he, Chris Tip Moore. Why well, settle for less when you can have more with the vision and be generational because it's always time to be. And today I have a very special guest, a guy who's very knowledgeable when it comes to our Atlanta Hawks, and that is Mr. Kevin Chenard himself. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can you just, just for people who just may be under a rock and don't know who you are, could you just please just formally introduce yourself to my subscribers and viewers who may see this video? Sure. I'm, uh, I've been writing about the Hawks for about a decade, and I guess I've been with the Hawks themselves. I write for Hawks.com. I write for the, you know, the, the team's website on NBA.com, and uh, I've been doing that for about nine years, and I also have a podcast called ATL and 29 that I do mostly with Glenn Willis. Yes, sir. Yes, we, um, yes, I spoke to Mr. Willis a little bit myself. Yes, good guy, too. Very knowledgeable as well. And you guys hear it, man. You can always check out Ms. Uh, Shannara anytime. You, you really, if you have in the last for nine, 10 years, if you've been paying attention, he's been doing this thing. So I have uh, one question for you to uh, begin. I would like to know what was the thing that made you passionate about the game of basketball itself? That's a good question. I don't know. I mostly, I guess, playing the game. Ah, you played, huh? Well, I mean, not, I mean, I still play. I play more now than I did as a kid, but uh, yeah, I, en I enjoyed playing basketball growing up. Uh, I like basketball and tennis were kind of my, my two sports. Uh, I guess I played some baseball too, but it was never as fun. Right. And by the time I was done with high school, I was like, yeah, baseball's not really fun. <laughs> but I like playing basketball. Yeah, I've always liked playing basketball. Uh, I'm 51. I'm I'm counting down the years until I'm no longer able to play basketball. I don't know when that happens, but uh, in about half an hour, I'm about to head out and, and get a game in the sunshine here. Hey, man, that sounds wonderful, man. Yeah, I actually um, did some hooping myself last night, man. I try to go at least two or three times myself during the weeks, man, between work or whatever I have else going on. It's just... Yeah, basketballs, man, that's my first love right there. I'm always going to love her. <laughs> yeah, man, always going to love her, man. But, yeah, man, you look good, man. I said 51 still hoop, man. I love to hear that, man. You can, hey, man, it's really up to you, man, as far as how much you want to hoop and everything, man. It's telling you it's up to us, man. It's all up to you. But, all right, I want to get into this Hawks, Atlanta Hawks, man. Atlanta Hawks, they wrapped up Summer League. Of course, going three and two, losing in the constellation round to the Dallas Mavericks. But um, I want to talk about our 15th overall pick here, uh, Mr. Kobe Buff the Stuff Buffkin. Uh, in 27 minutes, you know, he averaged 14 points, uh, with about three and a half assists. Now, it's only five games, so I don't want people to get crazy or anything because the game has to slow down for Kobe, I believe, and he lets, needs to let the game come to him. That's my personal opinion. But um, also 33% from the field and 13% from three, including going 0 for six against the Mavericks. But overall in his last two performances, we know he was balling, you know, it's a fourth quarter, 11 points, and also just doing his thing in uh, the last game, completely taking over if you ask me. I want to know, are you concerned at all with the slow start to Kobe, or do you feel like the last two games are the player that the Atlanta Hawks are pretty much going to have? No, I mean, I, I I went to Utah Summer League when Trey went 0 for 10 or whatever in his first game. And I mean, I, I saw a great pace in Kobe's game in Summer League. I, he felt like he had the command of the game. He felt like he had the right footwork, the right timing. I thought he mixed in some, some changing speeds when he was on the ball. I just thought... You know, I thought we saw a little bit of everything from him. You know, he, he drew, could drive right. He got some drives left. Right. He, they didn't really have a great, like, pick and roll dive man for him to work with. But when they did some of that, he got comfortable in that, too. Right. I just thought he had a, a good pace and a good control of the game. He's kind of feeling out. It's really like an entirely new geometry playing the NBA game compared to college the spacing is different the three point line is different the you know the the big man planted at the basket that you might see in college basketball isn't there because of defensive three seconds so it's just 
it's an entirely different game and, and I thought that he adapted really quickly to the new spacing and the new rules and the new feel I thought he had a great feel and you know honestly one of the things that I was most encouraged by was just he got comfortable enough that I, I felt like he got to play with the parameters a little bit there was one game I don't remember I felt like it was kind of in the middle maybe the third game second game something like that and you know he just he was doing some driving and he was he was kind of feeling out like the little hand chicken fighting that a point guard will do to make space you know, if he's dribbling with his left because he's a lefty, then, you know, it's your right hand just kind of trying to push somebody off or make a little bit of space. And he got called for some offensive fouls. I don't know. You, know, yeah, you can probably kind of say, fun. oh, yes, it's a foul or no, it's not a foul. The Vegas, you know, the referees in Las Vegas are getting their feel for the game, just like the players are getting the feel for the NBA game. It's a learning experience for everybody, referees com- uh, included in that. So, you know, just the fact that he was trying to feel out the rules and try to say, okay, what can I do? What can I get away with? When do I cross the line? And they're not going to let me get away with it. I just felt like he had enough command that he was feeling out his parameters and just testing to see what, what's going to work and what isn't. Indeed. Indeed. Very great analysis. And I totally agree. He was feeling things out. I mean, like again, like I was saying, the game's got to come to him. He's got to figure it out. But I do like what I've seen, like I said, really overall in his performances. I do like what I've seen. Some people, you know, are kind of uh, skeptical about him right now. But in the beginning, you know, everybody's got to fill it out. Like you said, different geometry, totally different game, NBA game being from NCAA. So I believe Bufkin is going to be fine. I believe he's going to be able to really work that uh, that one four pick and roll pretty good. Once he has like a good guy that he really just a good center, good big man to really just do it with, and something that Atlanta does have. So I'm not worried about Bufkin. I just think more reps, more muscle memory as far as on the court and everything. And I believe more game- muscle too, not just muscle memory, but muscle. You're right. You're right. <laughs> I don't have to get into the gym. It's definitely yeah. a different league, man. It's definitely a different league. So, But I believe he has the capability. It's all on him. All right. So moving on, I want to talk about technically one of the rookie veterans. I want to talk about Mr. A.J. Griffin, who's been catching a little bit of slander. I don't know if you've been seeing it, but he's been catching a little bit of slander on his performance in summer league, uh, you know, being sixth on the team and scoring. And only averaging about nine points and coming into it, you know, a lot of us Hawks fans and then probably maybe some people who cover the Hawks, you know, not everybody watches the games. We know that. But some people that try to cover the Hawks, you know, expecting A.J. Griffin to be that kind of that focal point for summer league this year. Are you concerned by A.J. Griffin's uh, lack of performance or anything? And, And what do you have to say about any type of slander that's coming his way as he's a great young talent? And I believe that the Hawks should definitely keep him, no trades, anything like that. Yeah, I mean, of if if we're talking in terms of the Pascal Siakam trade, if if that goes down, like the one the one name that I just don't want to see in there is AJ Griffin. Like I really don't want to see Jalen Johnson or uh, Nyeka Kong or somebody like that in there either. But I really don't want to see AJ's name in there. I think he's like the perfect kind of player to play next to Trey. Indeed. And so, you know, and then that kind of ties into his summer league. Like he's the kind of player that you want to touch the ball second. Like you don't really want him to touch the ball first. In Vegas, he was touching the ball first. They put the ball in his hands and said, AJ, go create, which is not what he did in his rookie year. No. He would be out there playing with Trey or he'd be out there playing with DeJounte. And, you know, Trey or DeJounte would create the play. They would suck the defense in. And then the ball goes to AJ. And whether it's for an open shot or maybe somebody scrambles for a closeout and then he attacks the closeout, like he is absolutely great in that secondary role. I mean, he's his, he's got an unbelievable jump shot. It's so on balance. It's got a high release. It's unbelievably accurate. Yes. And then apart from that, if you chase him off that, he's he was really steady you know, attacking the seam, uh, attacking whatever space is there also. Like, he, he's got a nice uh, – it's almost like a post-up game. If, if you chase him off and he gets into the paint and he doesn't like the first shot, 
you know, head fake, pivot, head fake, pivot. It's not glamorous. It's not going to get anybody too excited on, on YouTube or something like that. But like, yeah, it's yeah. Just super, yeah. super steady. And, you know, there is a drawback to that. Like sometimes if you do that, you have to just forfeit and say, okay, uh, the, whatever, you know, I've thrown, I've, I've done three fakes. It's not worked. Uh, I'm going to have to kick the ball back up to Trey or something with five seconds on the clock. Cause it's a 24 second shot clock in the NBA. So, you know, if he does that and it doesn't work, he's probably not going to miss a shot or turn it over, but you know, uh, there, there is still a little bit of, uh, a little bit of a drawback. And so you want his game to get a little more dynamic on those drives. You want to see some more floaters, some more Euro steps, something that can happen a little bit quicker and a little bit more smoothly, but just in terms of what his role is, he's really good at it. And so in Vegas, they gave him a new rule. They said, try to create off the dribble. And right. <laughs> no. I, I thought he was a little bit shiftier, uh, but it's just a new role. And so he doesn't look perfectly great in that new role. But that's not going to be his role to start the season anyway. It's going to be Trey's job. It's going to be DeJounte's job. And he's just going to be playing off that. And he's he's super suited for that. Exactly. Exactly. Man, I made a video about A.J. Griffin, man. And um. Pretty much like I was saying, he, he just needs more playing time. He needs more shine, more time a day, and more people to get out of his way. And just going to your point about just his role, I mean, A.J. Griffin shot 39% from three last year, 53% from inside the arc when he's ran off the three-point line, catering to your point. And also, he was 69% on assisted made baskets, going to your point about DeJounte and Trey sucking in the defense, and also – when he did have to create his own, he was only like 30% on unassisted baskets. So that goes to your point about, you know, he wasn't really called to create his own shot, but that's pretty much what they did in Vegas was saying, hey, go create AJ. But yeah, hey, I believe AJ is going to be fine. I really hope he does not get traded. Like that that's one of the names, him and double O. I definitely don't want to see them two gone. And I want to see more of Jalen Johnson. So I want him in Atlanta as well. So, but yeah, man, I believe AJ Griffin is going to be fine. And I want to dial back just a little bit because you did mention his name and I actually do have a question about him, Mr. Pascal Siakam. So with everything that's been going on and after the Hawks summer league, do you really, what are the chances? What are the realistic chances of this deal actually going down? The Siakam deal for the Raptors is kind of like the Collins thing for the Hawks but super accelerated because Siakam's going to be on an expiring contract. So the timeline, they, they can't drag it out for years and years the way the Hawks did with, with Collins. It's, it's got to happen more quickly. And so I just think that there's a lot of pressure for the Raptors to make a move if they don't want to pay him his next deal. If they're feeling bad about that next contract for him, They've got to make a deal, and there's not a super long list of suitors. Uh, you know, maybe the Pacers, maybe the 76ers, maybe the Hawks. But if there's a limited number of teams and there's a timeline and, and the clock is ticking, mm -hmm. that tends to bring the price down a little bit. Indeed. So, yeah, I think, I think you know, the lowering of the price, just because the Raptors are going to be under pressure a little bit, makes the likelihood of a deal uh, increase. I think that, that there's – a decent chance that such a trade happens uh, before we get too far into the season, just because it, it's a time crunch for the Raptors. And so they, they probably feel like they have to do something. They have to do something soon. And if there aren't a whole lot of teams, then, then that increases the odds that the Hawks are the ones that actually end up pulling the trigger on it. Indeed. Now, man, for me, for Pascal, man, I just, I've been hearing all these reports about him possibly not even want to like resign with whatever team, you know, pretty much trades for him. And, I mean, right now, shoot, the biggest team that's been talking about trading for him is us. So, like, I don't know necessarily want a guy who doesn't want to be here because I'm not into rentals. Like, I want to – I'm not into rentals at all. I would like to own, you know, so or not even necessarily own. I would like to extend NBA terms. I would like to extend and, you know, I'm saying to have a focal point at our forward slash, you know, I'm saying maybe a stretch five position depends on, you know, the lineup. But – I mean, Siakam, man, you can't deny it. I mean, the guy, he's a talent, and he can pass out of the post. That's something that I like about him the most, that he is a willing passer. And, you know, he'll be a great player in Atlanta, man, but I'm just 
I guess I'm just nervous. I'm just worried about a guy who technically has already got reports out there and not denying them that he may not even resign with the uh, with the team. Yeah, I mean, I think that's I think that's a valid concern, but I think maybe he's sort of overplaying his hand a little bit because, you know, number one, if he says, hey, I'm not sure about resigning, that gives him more control now. The teams are going to come to him and say, hey, uh, we were thinking about making a move for you, but we want to know, you know, do you think you would be happy here? So he gets more control, more input now about where he ends up getting traded. So that's a good thing for him to say that so that he gets that control. And it, I think going to free agency for him would be a big risk because his next contract is going to be a big one if he does it with the extension. Right. And if he goes to free agency, there will be teams with room and he would certainly be a, you know, a top tier free agent. But uh, if there are other top tier free agents in the same class, you know, that, that space could get closed out pretty quickly. I, I think there's a significant risk for him if he goes all the way to free agency. So I think it gives him more control right now in the moment. But, uh, you know, security on an absolutely massive deal is a good thing. And, you know, players of his caliber, if they don't like their destination, even after they've extended, they can usually just say, hey, I, I want to go somewhere else. And it happens for them anyways. So I think it just gives him more control right now in the moment. I think he probably will extend wherever he goes and, uh, you know, probably stay there. But even if not, you know, the, the extension is the contract. And, and I think that's what his next contract will be. I think it will be an extension. And then it's just a matter of does he like that spot or does he stay there a couple of years and say, hey, actually, I'd like to go somewhere else. Indeed. OK, I can I can definitely I can see that. Yeah, I like the way how you broke that down. I can definitely see that, man. Um, Like I say, I just like I just that's just my concerns. Just like you say, he does. The ball is really in his court, and he does have the control with that with that statement. But it's just like, man, all the guys who that we have here pretty much have stated they want to be here. And if you do make the trade for him, let's say you do make the trade for him, you do have time to, I guess, win him over. You know, win, put, get some southern charm on him, and maybe uh, he will change his mind if if that if that's how he's feeling even after a trade being done. But speaking of trades, not any, not even talking about Pascal Siakam, um, Clint Capella, DeAndre Hunter, you know, these guys have been mentioning trades. We already know that DJ is locked up, and I definitely know that they didn't extend him just to trade him. I, that's not my personal opinion. But I want to know, do you see the Atlanta Hawks being forced to run this back in a way? Or will, this, will a deal, some order, sort of other deal be done for Capella? or DeAndre Hunter? I think the Hawks have set themselves up to be a good team this season. Uh, you know, I think Quinn Snyder is going to be better in year two than year one. I think he gets to do more of his own stuff, run more of his offense. So I think the Hawks have set themselves up for success. And I think they're going to have a complete team, whether they do a deal or not. But, you know, if, if if they trade for Siakam, I still think that, you know, with Anyeka Kongwu in the fold, uh, you're probably sending out the Hunter and Capella contracts because that's the only way that makes sense financially so that you can sign that extension that Siakam uh, will probably extend if you can get him to do that. So I, I think to make the, the trade make sense financially, you're going to have to send out C Capella and Hunter uh, to get Siakam just so that dollars and cents wise it makes sense uh, but I think either way they, they're going to have a pretty complete team for this upcoming season I don't know if I would call it running it back uh, it, it'll be different without Collins yeah and I think I think really this season you know the 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 thing that maybe is most different is that it is going to be about AJ Griffin. Like I think he is the, the new face, you know, maybe Siakam comes in and then he's obviously the new face, but if not, if they, if they do kind of keep most of the roster the same, you know, the, the two biggest changes are going to be, okay, what, what do we get out of Quinn Snyder? And, you know, what do we get out of AJ Griffin? If he's a regular rotation player at 20, uh, you know, I think that's going to be a really interesting season for him uh, with a year of NBA experience under his belt and, you know, 
it's just completely different than what it was for him a year ago because coming into last season, like he couldn't do summer league. He was hurt. He had an injury history. There were you know, the reason he even dropped to the Hawks was, Hey, he gets hurt a lot. Exactly. Didn't play that much at Duke. Didn't play, you know, had, had some injury stuff in high school. Um, he looked pretty healthy last season. Like there weren't a whole lot of times where if they wanted to play AJ, they couldn't because, Oh, well he's, he's hurt. That didn't really happen. Like he's, he's growing into his body. He's maturing. He's like his, what he looks like at age 20 just doesn't even make sense. Like, it's just ridiculous. Like that does not look like a 20 year old. That looks like a 30 year old. Like, Indeed. Uh, so, you know, to, to be that big and that strong at that, you know, young age, 16, 17, 18, like, you know, it, it, I, sometimes I think, you know, guys like that get hurt just because they're, they're so young and so big and so powerful that right. the rest of their body hasn't caught up. And now I think it has. And uh, I'm interested to see, I think he's, he along with Quinn Snyder and really the two of them together are, are going to be sort of the most interesting change for the upcoming season. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I believe Quinn Snyder is going to get his hands on AJ Griffin, put some good philosophy on him, man. And then we're going to have ourselves a complete player, man. Cause AJ has, I believe, great tool, size, speed. Like you said, man, for a 20 year old, he looks like out there looking like a 29, 20, no, 27 year old Eric Bledsoe. And I don't, I mean, he's a big guy. I mean, and he's, he can play the three as well, man. So. I'm yeah, really- that's, that's interesting. Like, I want to know that, that that's really one of the things I want to see this season is like, okay, you kind of have a feel for you know what he's going to be on offense. Right. I think the defense is going to look a lot different without Collins this season. I think Quinn has a tendency to play a little bit smaller than maybe Nate would. And, and, you know, Collins going out of the equation and maybe somebody like Bay coming in kind of leads itself to some of these smaller lineups. AJ's not maybe the quickest guy, maybe not the guy best suited for guarding somebody who's super duper fast. But I want to know this season, like, okay, who does he guard? Well, what kind of players can he guard? What kind of players can he guard? Well, uh, I'm interested to see, you know, how he fits in defensively this season and, and what he can offer, because I think he's pretty sharp and pretty savvy for a kid his age on defense. And, you know, physically, where does he fit along with the rest of the roster and the way Quinn likes to play defense? Where does he fit? These are all things that I, uh, I think he's really the most interesting piece this season. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, especially to see how does he fit on defense? Like what, what makes this work and, you know, how good is it? Yep. Yep. I mean, yes, absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Because man, that defensive end, I believe if he can find his niche on the defensive end, he would definitely be able to find the court more because we know he, what he can do on offense. But that defensive end, we already know that really is what's going to get you the playing time, especially in a kind of like in a loaded lineup. And, and just in that area, you still have bogey and you still have uh, other guards who are coming in to try to make a name for themselves. So it's like, yeah, AJ coming into second year, I just want him to get his opportunities because I'm really high on AJ Griffin. I really am. I really, I was very surprised last year, even though with the injuries and everything that the Hawks were able to snatch him up because I know last year I was talking about trying to trade these picks, but then again, it was a guy named Kevin Durant out there. So at that particular time, but yeah, AJ Griffin. And I believe that the Hawks are going to do some great things with him. Um, just last a uh, few notes before I uh, let you up out of here, man. Pretty much. I want to know, do you believe that the Atlanta Hawks believe in AJ, Jalen, and Double O to give them more minutes this year to produce for the team? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think for for all three, that's true for differing reasons. I think for AJ, it's uh, you know just an unbelievable you know just unbelievable promise. They have to give him a bigger role and then just see what they have. Uh, I think for Jalen, we've already seen it. Like as soon as Quinn took over, the 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 thing that changed most when Quinn Snyder took over, rotation wise, was all of a sudden he had Jalen guarding perimeter players. Like Nate Nate wanted Jalen to guard centers and power forwards, and then uh, Quinn is like, oh well, we need you, and we'll we need him for what? Well, all of a sudden he's guarding like big small forwards and things like that. If Hunter goes out then they absolutely have to rely on Jalen Moore because they're not going to have, they mean, unless they make some other signing, they don't really have anybody to stop a big, uh, you know, a big small forward. Uh, they're they're going to need Jalen to, for some point of attack defense. And then on I mean, I, 
I, absolutely. Like he has to play more. He has to do more. If Clint goes out, then he absolutely positively has to pay, play more. Uh, I think it's, it's about time for him to take over the starting role, but at the same time, you know, to, to tie back to what we were just saying about, they don't have any point of attack defense. Uh, point of attack defense is big. If you lose Hunter and you don't have point of attack defense and you're playing with a smaller center, like a Kong Wu, who's six, eight, right. uh, you've got to stop people before they get into the lane, because if you let them in the lane and you're saying, Hey, six, eight center, go solve all our problems. He's going to be in foul trouble. A lot. Of and, uh, you don't, I mean, if you send Capella out and you don't have that other center, you know, other really high quality caliber center, and you don't have the point of attack defense, you know, I believe in Inyeka. I think he could play well, but the rule is the rule. You only get six fouls. And so um, I just don't know how they make that work uh, unless they either get better point of attack defense or, or add some other key defensive center if, if Capella goes out. Yep. Yeah, Mr. Chenard, I really enjoy this conversation because some of the things that I was waiting to, I figured you was going to answer a lot of my questions without even me even asking them is then, and that's just what you did, especially in that last one was talking about the point of attack. And if you send out Capella, that means you're relying completely on double O. And that's why me personally, as a Hawks fan, I believe we should start the season with Capella still as center. And we just allow on to get more minutes. Still let Capella, you know, be on the team. That's just my personal opinion because Anyeka is a great talent. I just feel like he needs more time to show that, hey, look, yeah, I'm ready to take over the keys from CC, and I'm ready, y'all. Like, I really need to see that because I believe in him, but I, I just want to start this season, Capella, and just give Anyeka more minutes. And I believe if you, the Hawks will do that we'll be able to get kind of an answer and be able to see if Onyeka really can do this and take over for CeCe. Because if we find out that he can't, then that's a whole nother problem that you have. Yep. Yes, sir. Well, thank you, Mr. Shannar. I thank you so very much for taking the time out of your busy schedule. I know you're about to get some hooping in. I really appreciate <laughs> you coming on, man. I'm going to have to catch you on that court, man. I'm really going to uh, I'm have to pull up and see what's going on, man. Yeah, come out to Shady Valley Park. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah, we're gonna yeah, we're gonna, we, we're gonna talk offline, man. We're gonna talk offline. Yes, sir. Well, I can just I'm telling everybody, we you know. Hey, hey, pull up, y'all. Hey, yep, there you go. Pull up, everybody. We're gonna get some hooping in, man. You already heard it. We're gonna definitely do this, man. But thank you again. And until next time, be generational because it's always time to be. Why sort of less we can have more with the vision. And come on back to the show that's cool and fly to A1 Forever Sports with your host, Chris Tip Moore. Until next time, thank you for my special guest, Mr. Kevin Shannard, for coming on Atlanta Hawks, man. You can definitely catch him. And please, one more time, tell them where they can catch you at, Mr. Shannard. Hawks.com and ATL and 29 podcast. Yes, sir. You heard it right there. So until next time, peace and blessings to you, and I will holler. What's up, A1 family? Are you subscribed? If you are, Thank you so very much, and you have all my gratitude. If you're not, go ahead and subscribe so you can get this content and be a part of the A1 family, the family that is cool and fly too.